Welcome to Simply RN. This is a new series that I am doing to help nurses who are interested in oncology and those who are studying for their OCN tests. This video is for educational purposes only and not indicated for clinical use. Today's topic is tumor lysis syndrome or TLS. TLS is an oncological emergency that often occurs after initiation of chemotherapy, causing destruction of cancer cells. But TLS can also occur spontaneously in cancer patients with bulky disease or large tumor burden. When cancer cells lyse or die, there is massive release of cell contents into the bloodstream such as potassium, phosphorus, and uric acid. This elevated level of electrolytes in the blood cause kidney injury and fatal arrhythmias. There are several risk factors associated with TLS. TLS is more common in hematological malignancies such as aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or T-cell ALL, Burkitt lymphoma, and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL. Patients with large tumor burdens are also at risk for TLS. For example, tumor size of more than 10 centimeters in diameter, WBC count of more than 50,000, and or lactate dehydrogenase or LDH level is two times the upper limit of normal before treatment. If patients already have pre-existing kidney dysfunction, elevated uric acid or phosphorus at baseline, or dehydration before the start of chemotherapy, they are also at risk for TLS. But most TLS occurs due to initiation of chemotherapy, especially during or after the first treatment. Some targeted therapy also increases the risk of TLS, such as rituximab for high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma, obinutuzumab for refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, bortezomib for multiple myeloma, imatinib for CML, venetoclax for CLL or AML. TLS is mostly diagnosed with labs. Hyperkalemia is often the first lab abnormality. It occurs in 6 to 72 hours after initiation of chemotherapy. It is defined as a potassium level of more than 6 or more than 25% increase from baseline. Hyperphosphatemia, or elevated phosphorus in the blood, occurs 24 to 48 hours after chemo. It is defined as a phosphorus level of more than 4.5 or more than 25% increase from baseline for adults. It is interesting to note that cancer cells contain four times the amount of phosphorus than normal cells. The excessive phosphorus binds with calcium and forms calcium phosphate crystals that can cause obstruction in the kidneys and AKI. Because calcium gets used by the phosphorus, hypocalcemia occurs in about 24 to 48 hours after chemotherapy. Hypocalcemia is defined as calcium level of less than 7 or more than 25% decrease from baseline. Hyperuricemia, or elevated uric acid in the blood, is defined as more than 8 or more than 25% increase from baseline. It occurs 24 to 48 hours after chemotherapy. Hyperuricemia can also cause AKI because the kidneys are unable to process the overwhelming level of uric acid, and some of them crystallize in the renal tubules and cause obstruction. It is important to note that high levels of both uric acid and phosphate increase the severity of AKI because uric acid precipitates readily in the presence of calcium phosphate crystals, and calcium phosphate precipitates readily in the presence of uric acid crystals. Creatinine is another lab to look at for TLS. It is defined as creatinine of 1.5 times the upper limit of normal. However, this is a limited assessment for those with chronic kidney disease, as they often have a high creatinine at baseline. Signs and symptoms of TLS are related to the electrolyte abnormalities and renal dysfunction. For example, there may be EKG changes and dysrhythmias associated with hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia. Gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and anorexia. Hypocalcemia can cause muscle cramps, tetany, and confusion. There may be decreased urine output or no urine output, and or presence of crystals in the urine which can cause flank pain. Treatment. Early recognition and prevention are the keys to TLS management. TLS labs such as BMP and uric acid should be monitored every six to eight hours for high-risk patients before and after initiation of cancer treatment. 
IV hydration can be initiated to prevent and treat TLS by increasing glomerular filtration and inducing a high urine output to decrease the likelihood of precipitation of uric acid and phosphate. Patients with intact kidney function should have about 3 liters of urine output per day from the IV hydration. However, IV hydration may be contraindicated in those with CKD and CHF. Diuretics such as Lasix may be used to induce urine output instead. Nurses should be recording accurate intake and output, and monitoring for fluid overload. Allopurinol and rasburicase are commonly used to prevent and treat hyperuricemia. Allopurinol decreases the production of uric acid, but is ineffective in treating any existing hyperuricemia. It is readily available in oral tablets and at low cost. Allopurinol should be started one to two days before treatment and continue during and after treatment. Monitor for allopurinol hypersensitivity syndrome, which includes skin rash, elevated eosinophil, which is a type of WBCs, and acute hepatitis. Allopurinol interacts with immunosuppressive drugs used in patients with solid organ transplant and autoimmune disorders. Raspericase is indicated for those with uric acid of more than 8. It rapidly breaks down uric acid to prevent and treat hyperuricemia. Raspericase is available in intravenous and intramuscular, but it is more expensive. Uric acid level should be drawn 4 hours after the first dose and every 6 to 12 hours thereafter until uric acid returns normal. Blood sample for rasburicase level needs to be collected in a pre-chilled tube and transported on ice to prevent rasburicase to continue to work in the tube. Febuxostat is a newer oral hyporacemic drug that may be used in those who cannot tolerate allopurinol, or if rasburicase is either not available or contraindicated. It is more expensive than allopurinol, but less drug-to-drug -drug interaction. For electrolyte imbalance, hyperkalemia is the most dangerous because it can cause deadly cardiac dysrhythmias. Standard hyperkalemia treatment includes giving intravenous insulin and dextrose, intravenous calcium gluconate, and oral potassium-lowering agents such as patyromer and lacalma. Patients should be placed on continuous cardiac monitoring. Hyperphosphatemia can usually be fixed by aggressive IV hydration and oral phosphate binders such as sevolamer. Most of the time, after hyperphosphatemia is corrected, hypocalcemia will improve because there is less phosphorus to bind to the calcium. So hyperphosphatemia should be corrected first before considering hypocalcemia treatment, which can make calcium phosphate precipitation worse. If the above measures are ineffective or if there is evidence of acute renal failure, hemodialysis should be initiated promptly. Thank you for watching. Make sure to check out my study guide for the OCN test in the description.